is Yesterzine, the monthly magazine show about monthly magazines. Every month, we pick up a magazine, play the games they liked most and least, and then flip through to find what it has to teach us about gaming when preview screenshots were ruined by bad printing rather than YouTube compression. And this month, we visit our first non-gaming magazine, PC Format, the ultimate bible for computing at the point I was just getting into the PC thanks to our shiny new compact Rosario. Two months from now, on a PC format cover disc, I would have my first encounter with the music you are literally now listening to. But we join it in June 1994, with just its second CD on the cover. And we're going to be looking at just how difficult it was to actually fill a CD back then. Their cover feature promised that CDs were the future, and we'll discover just how accurate they were with their future predictions in the era before Windows 95, and when games on floppy disk were still very much the norm. Games-wise, we have a point-and-click adventure that's unusual for two reasons. One, I've never heard of it, much less completed it. And two, it's a bad one. The lowest score of this issue. And quite frankly, I don't know how you can make a point-and-click deserve that. We'll find out. But amongst all this future tech, the gaming heaven came on floppies and needed just four megabytes of disk space. Blue Bytes, The Settlers. Now we're being a little bit naughty here. The Settlers is not the highest scorer in the issue. That honour goes to the CD version of Sam and Max Hit the Road. But not only have we looked at that before, PC Format has already reviewed the game on floppy, so I think it's fair not to count it. It's actually quite an interesting month. The Settlers 85% narrowly beat out Origin's somewhat forgotten sequel to Strike Commander, Pacific Strike, on 84. It's the debut of one of the quintessential CD-ROM classics in the adventure game Myst at 83. And, in a way that makes me almost suspicious they altered the scores based on other reviews, the famous XCOM series appears for the first time, as 82% goes the way of the game known in the UK as UFO Enemy Unknown. My favourite thing about the Settlers is, like XCOM, they retitled it, just for the Americans this time. The game debuted on Amiga a year earlier, but didn't get a US release until this MS-DOS port. If you are American, this is the game you know as, and get ready for this everyone else, Surf City Life is Feudal, which is about three puns in one title, one of which only works in an American accent. Beautiful. The Settlers broke ground. It's not a SimCity-like game. It's not a real-time strategy game. It's kind of both. It's also on a much grander scale computationally than the likes of SimCity, where your humans are basically just a number. Here, the first Settlers game is capable of keeping track of as many as 64,000 individual humans in a map, resulting in a scale that the manual claims means a game might even take the 50 hours the graph inside says it can. Having played it, I can absolutely believe this. So as such, we're going to dip into this one in a relatively shallow fashion. And first things first, as a person coming to this for the first time in 2021, I'm making one executive decision immediately. We are not playing this original release, because neither are you going to, unless you've still got the original floppies and an old PC. No, what you'll do is chuck Ubisoft £4. In 2018, they mildly remastered all seven Settlers games. They didn't change much at all apart from fixing control issues and bundling the expansion packs. But what they did crucially do is make it run natively in Windows 10, and that in itself is worth having. Some of the later games are on Steam as standalones, but this full collection and the early ones are exclusive to their own Uplay store. Usefully, it also comes with the 138 page instruction manual, which is a must read. The game has a tutorial, but in game those levels offer absolutely no instructions, you have to follow the paper guide and they're pretty important to run through. I don't think I'm spoiling anything to come by saying The Settlers is a game you cannot just dip into for 10 minutes on a Twitch stream. Developers Blue Byte, previously responsible for Battle Isle, were proud of that though. Yep. The manual's foreword is not modest. For the first time, users can enter a world so complex, so detailed, that they will literally want to plunge themselves into the game with The Settlers we have achieved the goal that programmers have set for themselves since the beginning of video games. Create a new world for the player, where the adventure never ends and can continue based on the desires of the players 
to grow for years to come. It goes on in this vein for about another five pages, explaining the kind of thing that's taken as read with a game like this now. About balancing people and buildings, money and resources, making tea and the need to go pee, the usual stuff. The basics to know about construction is that when you want a building, it has to be somewhere with space, indicated by the icon, and you have to connect it to the castle as part of your road network, the efficiency of which becomes really quite key in large maps. Once that's defined, the settlers will generally just try to make the best of things. While they are individuals, you don't need to micromanage them as you would in something like Command and Conquer. There are issues, mostly historical game design related. All the information you could want about stocks, busy workers, progress, etc. are all available, but it's all hidden in menus and you can't have it on screen all the time, which does make monitoring your progress a little tricky. You also really have to pick up on context clues. For instance here, where the workers marching in front of their mines means they have no food and are on strike, as you see when this guy gets a delivery and starts working again. It can be a lot to keep track of, especially at the slow pace of the game in general. I've certainly spent more time playing this than anything ever for Yesterzine, and I've barely scratched the surface of the thing. I'm not even showing you any of the combat, which can happen when there are competing CPU or human settlements, because to be honest it's not that interesting. It's a lot more fun to attempt to build a functioning settlement, with food production, resources, defence and all that entails, all working efficiently enough so stuff actually gets to people. Everything happening at a consistent non-instant pace really works for this game for me. I could take or leave combat, but just building is very satisfying. Seeing the little guys beavering away and gradually building up new infrastructure at a reasonable pace is much more interesting than the near instant appearance in something like SimCity. I remember the same from games such as the excellent Pharaoh game which came along a few years after this, and which is actually getting a remake very soon which I am entirely down for. This is another place where this Windows update helps. It's more than happy with you to do something on another monitor while it runs or to be minimised, so you can build an empire as a second screen thing while watching TV or getting on with writing the script to YouTube's fifth most popular magazine show. Despite the longevity of the series, this tidied up version of the original might be the one to play. The sequel reviewed well, and I note it's that one that got the 10th anniversary remake rather than this, but from then on the series changes direction rather. 3 and 4 were both criticised for having an over on combat, so no. And then it all goes 3D, and probably loses the sheer joy of the chill out building nature of these early titles. The series has been dormant for a decade, although a reboot was announced it appears to still be in limbo. Yeah, there's just a little bit too much old game unfriendliness in the Settlers view, and you want something similar, and slightly quicker paced, then actually I can help you Windows users out. 2014's Banished. Banished feels a lot more like a Settlers sequel than any of the Settlers 3 subsequent games appear to be. Developed by Tiny Software House Shining Rock, it dispenses with the combat entirely and is about survival in a world where the only way to grow your town is by birth rate and discovering and convincing wandering nomads. Or you know, wait for that reboot. Cover discs were obviously nothing new to PC magazines. PC format, now 33 issues old, had floppies on the cover since forever. And for issue 33, it was a lovely high density disc with 1.4 full megabytes of compressed goodness on it. I'm being flippant, but actually you could do a lot with that space even in 1994 if you knew your users had a hard disc to decompress onto. Cover Disc 33 featured a demo of the game we just looked at, The Settlers, and another of Pinball Dreams 2, which... Well, it's a rant for another time. The lineage of the 21st century pinball games is a little confusing but as a public service announcement, do not play this one. Dreams, fantasies, illusions on Amiga and virtually nothing else is acceptable. If you see the Spidersoft logo, close the game and then burn down your computer just to be sure. PC format not specifically being a games magazine meant there was even room to squeeze on a little Windows front end called Gaze. And so, the appearance in May 1994 of the cover CD understandably presents a problem for your average PC magazine. As an average here of 500 kilobytes a program, theoretically they would need to somehow have rights to include 1300 separate things in order to fill it. That's not going to happen, obviously. So how the hell did PC Format go about doing so? 
I couldn't get the cover CD from this issue, so I've gone with the previously mentioned fourth one from two months later. And immediately the first aspect of the answer to how do you fill a 650 megabyte cover disc in 1994 is, you don't. PCF4 clocks in at 435 megabytes. Still a hefty wadge of stuff by the day's standards. That's bigger than the hard drive that was in my PC at the time, after all. Imagine if they gave away a 6 terabyte cover disc today. So where is all this space going? Well, by and large, it's not really going to the headline axe here. The primary demo is for Yesterzine approved point and click adventure game Sam and Max Hit the Road, but that's only 15 megabytes. Second build Desert Strike isn't even a megabyte. Ishar 3 is another megabyte. The final large print program is Music at the Pianist, which is 200 kilobytes. The intro animation to the menu clocks in at more than those three put together. I say menu, but it's mostly just a list of instructions on how to run all the programs directly from the command line. Did I mention this was the PC circa 1994? I feel I must have. There is a menu, but it's just for the stuff that needs a hard disk install. Charmingly located just after the page telling you how to skip the intro animation that by definition you had already skipped if you are reading this page. There is, to be fair, some good stuff here. Sam and Max and Desert Strike are of course both excellent, but there's a good range for all tastes with these games, including a platformer by Doom Publishers Apogee. Although, if I'm honest, while I remember rating Hocus Pocus at the time, if you play it now, it's pretty clear that in the same year Sega were launching Sonic 3, perhaps a £2,000 PC should have been doing just a little bit better than this by now. Hocus still looks like a mid-tier Amiga game, and has controls noticeably stilted compared to its console friends at the time. Still, it's all welcome. I think I need to take a quick break to explain just how big having this much software on tap was you weren't exactly going to be downloading this stuff. Well less than 1% of the UK even had internet access, compared to 96% today. There were only 2,000 sites on the entire internet. Prevailing modem speeds were a little under 2 kilobytes a second, and you generally paid by the minute. At around 1p a minute for a local call, if you even had room to download this CD, it would take you nearly 3 days, and cost you just under £40 in phone line charges alone to do so. And if that doesn't sell how early we are in the march towards online, let me share with you the cover of the first PC format with a cover CD. Yeah, I'll just give you a few more seconds to really drink that one in. The various games and software on the disc together come to a little over 100 megabytes. So where's the rest gone? Well, it's basically various forms of lovely royalty-free media. And I say royalty-free in the sense that nothing has royalties if you don't ask. The biggest share of that space, another 100 megabytes, goes on a folder of 12 fractal animations. 100 megabytes well spent, I think you'll agree. Especially if I show it you at the resolution it was recorded at. There it is. There, in the middle. There. Ah, 1994. A further 60 goes on some high quality images using the prevailing professional file format of the time, TIFF. What passes for high quality back then? This does. And to be fair, they're certainly high quality. They're also 640 by 480 pixels, which makes them sadly fairly useless for desktop wallpaper now. And to be fair, they would have been fairly useless then too. Windows didn't support images with this many colours as wallpaper until Windows 95. Moving on, another 50 goes on some entirely random video for Windows codec videos. Obviously by today's standards this is not exactly high definition. It's barely definition, but there is some fun here. The first I opened, world1.avi, is that footage of the moon landing they shot at Pinewood Studios, and includes Neil Armstrong fluffing his lines in the first take. Again, it is easy to take the piss now. It's also fun, but this is just not something you'd have on your PC any other way. The CD encyclopedias were only just crawling out, there's no Wikipedia or YouTube, and unless you got lucky and it was repeated on TV, you might never have seen footage like this. 
These days, of course, we can strap on a headset and live it in incredible definition thanks to the excellent Apollo 11 VR. But back then, this would have been your lot. Equally in VR, we have the lovely The Blue for Under the Water, but back then, you got this grainy video or nothing. Hell, you probably watched footage like this back then with David Attenborough talking over the top, and that's not something that would happen these... D oh wait. Okay, some things haven't changed. Please don't die before this goes out, Sir Dave. Still, even with all that known, it seems amazing that our only hope of seeing any USA life is this 15 second shot of a random American street shot on a potato. Next for me though comes the treasure trove. I've done a video on this before, but if I were to open the mod folder and double click this file, I imagine you'll find it faintly familiar. Yeah, this is Twelfth Warrior by Bjorn Lin, then better known as Dr. Awesome, and now much better known as the creator of many of your favourite game themes, including that for Worms. He's also the owner of music licensing company Shockwave Sound, by whose kind permission Twelfth Warrior is the much lesser known theme tune to your favourite YouTube series. And it was this disc, and this file, an astonishingly tiny 138 kilobytes, where I first discovered it. Did PC Format in any way license it? I really bet they didn't. Or the other 289 files in this folder. Especially as one of them is Twelfth Warrior again. And one of the others is very clearly the theme tune from the TV series Airwolf. Still, none of this mattered to a 13 year old whose only other method of getting music was attempting to tape it off the radio or buying albums on cassette. 30 megabytes doesn't go as far as it does with the mods, with a bunch of WAV files with similar names to the videos, but which don't seem to be the soundtracks for them. I'm not sure what I can even say about this lot, except to play you this. Try and guess its one word name before it finishes. To give you an idea, we have Tropic, Deep and US elsewhere in the folder. That was business. Clearly I've been so long since I've been in an office, what with the plague and everything, I've forgotten what they were like because I do not remember that at all. A whole 1.6 megabytes is taken up by some classic MIDI, such as this royalty free version of Beethoven's Fifth that really does lose something if we pipe it through Windows 10's sod it that will do sound font. What's left? Well, not a lot. We've got a bit of art to come. First, some 3D CGI pictures, an invaluable resource if you have, for instance, forgotten what a living room looks like, or a canyon, or in the three minutes since we saw the video, another sodding fractal. Licensed? Dunno. They come from a range of weird locations, including a single shot from the least interesting area of the seventh guest. The last location appears to be mostly bitmap versions of those TIFFs, including one to go with business.wav. This is what business looked like in 1994, folks. I'm suddenly starting to think that Job Simulator was not the parody I'd always assumed. Still, we can be mean, but when this was your only source of new things to cram into your PC that month, for a fiver, including a magazine, there's a lot of fun to be had here, especially from those games and applications. In fact, I want to save a special mention for one of those application demos, Paint Package Fauve Mertice. Because how do you demo a paint package? Just give them the obvious features? Well, then you're just showing them Microsoft Paint. Give them a bunch of stuff? Well, that might be all they ever need and there's no need to buy the product. The solution Fauve Mertice went with was, give them everything. Oh, but it'll only work in grayscale. Brilliant. This problem solved itself, of course. As more and more things came on CDs, then the cover CDs filled up with CD-based demos and the brief period of throwing any old crap on it to justify its existence was, sadly, over. 
Just as there's some famous games at the top end of the reviews, there's some famous dross at the bottom end. Amiga cast off Diggers, for example, a game so famously bad it was given away with Amigas by Commodore in an effort to get people to buy new games rather than play the ones in the box. To calibrate your review sensors, that gets 41%. Graphics over gameplay CD-ROM puzzle game The Lawnmower Man suffered mainly for the fact they scrapped the version with the good graphics and shipped something a Mega CD could have pulled off for 55 actual quid. That got 34%. Point and click adventure Red Hell though? 23. You would think a point and click adventure was pretty tricky to get that wrong, wouldn't you? Especially in the post text parser era. A few semi decent puzzles, half a story, and an interface that lets you walk, talk, use, and pick up. Done. Certainly, the CD version of Sam and Max from this issue is absolutely a textbook example of how to do it. Brilliantly humorous, just the right amount of tricky puzzles, and controls that only do the job they need to, not getting between you and the solutions. It'll be interesting to see which of these Red Hell gets wrong. I'm guessing all of them for that score. And the first thing it gets wrong is, its own name. You see, Red Hell is originally a game called Chronologue the Nazi Paradox. It tells the story of an alternate world where the Germans had gone one place better in World War II, and wacky thunster Adolf Hitler had gone double or quits by trying to take over the entire rest of the world. In that, you play Hoffman, a member of a government searching for his missing son. This though was the period where Germany's sense of humour about any fictional Nazi based media was nil. This is why many versions of Wolfenstein 3D look faintly ridiculous. And given there's no digital distribution, Castleworks Gameware simply rewrote the thing a bit for the whole of Europe. And by rewrote we mean they renamed the title character Constantine, declared the Russians winners of World War II using some historical VAR and called it good. So I think it's fair we give this one a chance by playing the original as intended version. A disturbingly low resolution intro, to which I'm sure adding another round of video compression will only help, explains that basically the world is now Nazi. Which, as we'll soon find out, is English with questionable accents. Your character is involved in the resistance, but also owns a biotech company, apparently trying to help solve the massive pollution and climate change issues the world faces in the far future year of, let me check my notes, 2020. Shit. But fair enough. As the game starts, you are called to totally not Nazi HQ for a meeting with important bloke 7. The first impression is that this is pretty reasonable. It looks like most VGA point and click adventures, like a less stylish beneath a still sky maybe. The controls look okay, we've got the standard walk use look icons for instance. Let's try talking to this guard. Rude? Okay, we'll walk up to him to talk then. And frankly, given that I'm now so close to him I feel I may be technically married to him in some jurisdictions, this seems more rude. How's it going Jack? Dr. Hoffman! What brings you to the grand and glorious federal district today, huh? <laughs> Proconsul Zimmer called me over to discuss our newest development. It looks very promising. Yeah! The what game is partly voiced, like with key conversations occurring in speech like that one. Keep that sun comment in mind, by the way, but in the meantime we'll take a look around, noting that it's a game of few words. There's zero music either, which, on the plus side, is going to make this video a lot easier to edit, but it's also very dull. So let's see what I can find in his lovely Patreon royalty free library and imagine this soundtrack by industry great Chris Hulsbeck. Oh yeah, that'll do it. You really do have to walk up to literally everything in order to interact with it. If you remember Police Quest from last year, I'm getting those kind of vibes already. Very Sierra busy work. Another thing it doesn't do though, is navigate you round obstacles. You have to make every move yourself with a mouse. It doesn't support keyboard to get anywhere. It's a good thing that this game isn't three years newer than Monkey Island or anything, otherwise this would be horribly embarrassing. And just to nail in that police quest comparison, you have to select use and press the call button in order to call the lift. 
because of course you do. And it really is going to make you do everything, because when you get in the lift, you have to go into your inventory, get that access card, use it on the slot in the lift, hit the floor button, even though there is only one floor button that will work, take the card, exit the lift, and then select walk again. There's going to be pixel hunting too. Only the fact I spent the entire last two decades of the 20th century playing these games trained me to spot that tiny yellow speck on the table. Even so, the game makes me go and look before I can take it. At this point you start to fear we might be in for a greatest hits compilation of all the things a point and click adventure can do wrong. And it's not the point, but that is one hell of a character model. So we need to validate that card. See, I was paying attention. And that involves getting ourselves up to the machine over there. Which is really awkward. I discovered later that there isn't free movement as such. There are only parts of each screen that you can travel up and down on, and they're not marked. Which at least explains the lack of keyboard control. It does not make things easy though. And neither does the fact that you don't use this machine. You have to look at it. Despite use doing absolutely nothing else. This is the copy protection, by the way. It's a good thing this copy is cracked, because you literally have to build some sort of thing that feels a lot like one of those playground devices they used to use to scientifically determine who you fancied. You do need to get it right, because it's disabled the save menu. Oh, and you need to hit use before the buttons work, because that's normal. Welcome, Herr Hoffman. Thank you for responding so quickly to Proconsul Zimmer's request. I'm sorry to inform you that he has been called into an urgent meeting. Please come down, however. He left something for you to pick up. I have authorized your passage to and from the Proconsul's office on level S. Please take your card and proceed to the office elevator at this time. Exploring the bottom floor, we discover a vending machine in the loose that takes the coin we found on the table. Which worries me, because, spoiler alert, when we leave here we can't come back. So if this object is actually needed and you don't happen to amble into the toilets, you're going to lock yourself out of finishing the game. The toilets incidentally require your access card, despite being behind three other things that require your access card, as if your mum has been sneaking in to use them as a base of operations or something. We're here though to pick up an item from the only other accessible room on the floor, the office of the woman we spoke to a minute ago. You have to figure out you can access the desk from behind at this handy new camera angle in order to pick up his gift of a CD. Then you need to figure out the fax that's printing falls on the table and you need to look at the exact same thing again to do a snooping. And that's basically it for here. We leave, having a chat with both the secretary... Herr Hoffman, I see you found the CD that Proconsul Zimmer left for you. Regrettably, your meeting with the Proconsul has been cancelled. He was called into emergency session with Dr. Melchior Grossman of Los Alamos. Yes, I know Dr. Grossman. In fact, do you think it might be possible for me to see him? and your frenemy, who informs you your son might be in trouble. Dr. Grossman, what brings you to the Federal District? Herr Hoffman, an unexpected pleasure. I am here to escort an experimental biochamber back to Los Alamos. You oh. with us. And by the way, Herr Doctor, just a word of friendly advice. You had better keep an eye on that boy of yours. He has been engaged in, how shall I put it, some rather questionable activities down in New Mexico. I have tried to play down certain incidents out of professional courtesy to you, but I am not sure how long I can continue to do so. We then leave, the lift apparently eating your access card. I thought I'd forgotten to take it at first, but either you can't get back to the lift, or the controls are really playing silly buggers with me. And then, just to annoy you, you can't get close enough to the car to use it, but get in it by simply walking off screen. The text implies he knows his son's been kidnapped or something, but the story hasn't really addressed that properly yet, so I don't know whether I missed something. It's difficult to want to find out though. There's just frustration at every turn with those controls. Everything you want to try and do becomes a battle against the game, even more so than with Police Quest. And in a genre where you naturally want to try things, games should not make that hard. A game starring a character with some knowledge should not put that on you. Maybe it's okay to make you use that lift card the first time, but you have to use it at least six times in the first chapter of this game, and there's just no mileage in making the player manually perform actions your character would naturally do. 
You might as well get us to press left leg, right leg individually to make them walk. We don't really have a handle on how bad the puzzles are yet either, but the fact we could already have locked ourselves out of finishing the game does not bode well. And I checked. That condom you have to go out of your way to buy in the first 10 minutes, the solution to the penultimate puzzle in the game. And you can't even go around making sure to pick up literally everything either, because there is an inventory size limit. Something completely pointless in a point and click. Not least because then it would just be an unclick. A glance at the walkthrough does reveal we did everything we could do in the first section, but also that we are already well over a tenth of the way through the game. If the controls were okay, this wouldn't be a bad thing now. It could be completable in a weekend, assuming someone told you about the condom. But there's just no joy where there should be here in exploring, because you're too busy yelling, get over there, you bastard. As it is though, I just can't really recommend trying it. It does nothing well, and what it does badly, it does really badly. If you can't be bothered to make moving around the screen work right, then I guess it's not a surprise the rest of the game works poorly. On the back page, an advert for the concept of subscribing. This isn't a plea to subscribe to this channel, although obviously you've already done that. But talking to normal humans who don't have YouTube channels, people don't actually know how this works. If you subscribe to a magazine, they deliver it to you every month. You know it's there. They tell you. If you subscribe on YouTube, it just quietly adds videos to a list, located here on the website, here on the iPad app, and who bloody even knows where on a smart TV or whatever. If your subscribe channel releases a video, that's all YouTube does. That's not subscribing in the traditional sense at all. That's like subscribing to a magazine and all it does is make the newsagent get a copy in, stick it on the shelf and go about his day. And that's why those channels tell you to hit the bell icon. Because that, my friends, is the traditional definition of subscribe. If your favourite, say, magazine-related YouTube channel uploads a video, it'll put a little notification here on the website. If you have the app and it has permission, it'll let you know with a pop-up. You actually have half a chance of knowing it exists and of course are somewhat more likely to actually watch the thing you'll presumably like. So that's why you get these annoying bits to various degrees at the end of virtually everything on YouTube. It's because the all-seeing algorithm that is YouTube Discovery effectively makes us. We're very sorry. It's not you, it's them. If you think you haven't heard from your favourite in a while, check. Because maybe they've been screaming into the void. Thank you for watching, and you do what you need to in order to make sure you come back for next month, and for the bonus videos throughout the month here on Yesterzine. We thank you for your viewing eyeballs. Cheers!